Welcome back. This is really part four of my lectures on simple linear regression. So here's the organization of, of, of this uh, unit. Uh, the first video I gave was really a, a high level overview of simple linear regression. And in that video, I, I took us through this slide with, um, with, with the basic properties of simple linear regression and, and, and helped you know, interpret all of this. And I basically said, trust me, trust me that here's the estimates, here's a good way to estimate the, um, you know, the, the standard error, uh, and then we can go do hypothesis tests and trust me. Um, then video two walked us through a, uh, a, a problem in depth where we applied all of these things and learned how to do regression on a real problem. Video three came back and filled in a lot of those things that I said trust me on. So what we did in that video was to derive the ordinary least squares estimates, and I also derived the properties of them. So we showed that they were unbiased, we showed that we could compute their variance, and that they were normal. And so those were the things that we needed in order to do our hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. Well, there's a few things that I've left off from, this, um, from, from these two slides, and I said, trust me on, the purpose of today's lecture is to fill in the rest of those gaps. So what did I say trust me on? Well, the first thing was, um, how do we estimate the residual standard error? So um, that's gonna be goal number one. And so we're gonna talk about uh, how the estimator that I've shown here um, for the mean squared error, not for the square root of the mean squared error, which is actually what's on the slide, is an unbiased estimator of the error variance. Okay, so that's gonna be uh, thing one that we're gonna talk about. Um, the next thing we're gonna do is talk about a very important um, you know, identity, if you will. It's called the ANOVA decomposition. And so this ANOVA decomposition is going to allow us to understand how well our model is doing. Something that is closely related to the ANOVA decomposition is a measure called R squared that you will see very commonly with regression. So we're gonna talk about what is this R squared? How do we interpret it? And um, the last thing that I, I, I'll just mention, so in, in my second video, we went through this problem and I showed you how you could estimate regressions in R. You can think about yesterday, we were talking about the coefficient box. So how do we know the standard errors? That's what we found yesterday. Um, T, T statistics and all that, the p-values and all that was dependent on, on um, the results that we had yesterday. We didn't really talk about the bottom part. So what's in the bottom part? Well, one is the residual standard error. So that's how we, that's our sigma, R squared. And then finally, there is this F test. So what is this F test? And, and we, we're, gonna, we're gonna cover that today. So these are, these are our goals for this video. Well, let's, um, let's go over to my, my document camera here, and let me just remind you of what our model is. So Y is just some intercept, alpha is the true intercept, beta is the true slope, um, times X plus some errors. So here is my uh, you know, true regression line, and what I'm assuming when I generate the data so when I generate the y's, what, what, what I'm doing is I'm taking some point in the line. So this is the point on the line. And then I'm adding some air to it according to a certain specification. And the specification is these errors have normal distributions around the regression line. So the errors um, have mean zero, meaning these normal distributions are centered at the line. And then the variance of these errors is constant for all values of x. So it doesn't matter if my x is small or big, um, the, the dispersion around the line is constant. Finally, we assume that these errors are independent and normal. We really need the normality for doing hypothesis tests, um, unless you wanna use a central limit theorem, in which case you know, that, that also gets you there. But um, we, um, we don't really need normality to do OLS. So, Yesterday, what I showed was the OLS estimates are 
uh, we can compute the slope as follows, and then the intercept is this, y bar minus b times x bar. Um, and this is extremely important because it says the regression line uh, passes through the point of means. So x bar, y bar is the point of means, and the regression line is going to pass through there. Well, let's talk a little bit about the ANOVA decomposition. I want to, I want to start with that. So I'm going to go draw myself a scatter plot with some real data. And so maybe this is my real data. And so I've, I've, I'm not going to go overboard with a lot of uh, values, but clearly this follows a, um, a, a linear pattern. And I could go estimate the OLS regression line. So maybe that's the OLS regression line. Think of this as, you know, y hat a plus b x. So um, this is not the true regression line. This is what I've estimated with my least squares. And the points on this line are called y hats. Now, the way we summarize the quality of this line for starters. Now, this is, this is um, th there's a lot more to it than this. We're going to be talking about out of sample measures when you get to a more advanced regression class. But for starters, the way we summarize this fit is we're going to look at the objective function. So what was the objective function? Well, the objective function was this. SSE is equal to the sum of squared errors. So i equals 1 to n, y sub i minus y hat sub i. And so the sum of squared errors are indicated by the lengths of my blue lines squared. So think of this as, you know, y1, this would be y hat 1. And I'm taking this minus this, which gives me the length, and squaring it. So that's the way to think about SSE. Well, um, we could have another model. So I, I, I want to talk about a specific set of hypotheses. So we could say this. Maybe my beta is equal to zero. And so this is no slope versus the alternative hypothesis, and we'll keep this in blue, my beta is not zero. Now, if the null hypothesis were true, if there were no slope, it turns out, so um, under the null, the OLS estimates would be A equal to X bar, sorry, Y bar, Y bar. All right, so in, in essence, I would have this as my estimated model, where this is y bar. All right, and, and I hope that has a, a little bit of, um, uh, you know, intuition. I hope that's kind of intuitive. But um, if you were to find the OLS, OLS estimates of this model, so minimize with respect to A, since there is no B in my model, the sum of y sub i minus a squared, um, you're going to find that a is just the mean of y. So you can think of, if I had a bunch of, of y values um, and, and I want to you know, have the least squares estimator of the intercept, it's just the mean. Well, how well does my, my, um, my y bar model fit the, fit the data? So I'm going to draw the residuals if I were to use my red model. So I'm taking the residuals under the red model. So I think we need a new sheet of paper for this. And this, um, this quantity is going to be called SST, the, the sum of squares total, or some textbooks will call it TSS for the total sums of squares. Whenever you see either one of those, uh, they mean the same thing. Now, we actually had another name for it, <laughs> and I, you, this is 
kind of crazy to have all these names for it. We call it SYY in my previous video. So what is this? This is just going to be the sum i equals 1 to n, y sub i minus y bar squared. But I think there's a really, you know, important different interpretation here, which is this is a summary of the objective function value, how much, you know, how, how big are your errors, if you constrain the null hypothesis to be zero. So now there is no relationship between x and y. I'm just giving it a line. I'm summarizing my y's with this, uh, with this line versus uh, what happens if I have um, a slope, in which case I get the blue line and I get the blue errors and I get SSE. Well, I now want to talk about um, a very important identity, which is the ANOVA identity. So the ANOVA identity is this. The sum of yi minus y bar is equal to the sum of y hat sub i minus y bar squared plus the sum of y sub i minus y hat sub i squared. So this is SST, this is SSE, let me write it correctly here, SSE, what, what I wrote earlier, and this thing here is going to have a, another name, which, uh, which we're going to call SSR for the regression sums of squares. So the total sums of squares equals the regression sums of squares plus the error sums of squares. So I'm going to go grab a marker here and draw SSR on this figure. So the way to think about this is it's the variation of your model. Okay, so what is the model? It's this line. So how much do, do the points on the line differ from the point of means? So I'm just going to draw those in. And so you can think about SSE is describing the variance of these errors around the line. Uh, SST is how much do, um, do, you know, do the points differ from the point of means. SSR is how much does the line vary from Y bar. And so the uh, ANOVA identity or the, the ANOVA decomposition decompos just says that the total variance in the data is just whatever the model explains plus whatever the model doesn't explain. So that's the, that's the way I like to think about it. Total variation is equal to um, the variation explained by the model plus the variation unexplained by the model. And so that's the way you should think about it. Now, one um, uh, way that we'll often summarize our model is how are these errors relative to these errors? Okay, so if I, if I don't give myself a slope, how do I do relative to if I do give myself a slope? And so the way we usually do this is we take r squared. Um, if you take here's SSR over SST, this is called the fraction of variance explained by the model. So here's the variation explained by the model. Here's the total variation in the data. That ratio is going to be the fraction of variance explained by the model. But I could replace SSR by SST minus SSE because of the ANOVA identity. We still have to divide by SST. Now, SST over SST is 1 minus SSE over SST. And so you can think of this piece as the fraction of variance unexplained by the model. So if you take 1 minus what the fraction that you didn't explain, you get the fraction you did explain. And so that's what r squared is all about. To, um, to, to kind of make this obvious 
let's go look at a couple pictures. So let's say I had a scatter plot that looked like this. And what I'd like you to know, notice is that all these points fall exactly on the regression line. So in this case, SSE is equal to zero because notice there are no deviations from the regression line. The, um, the model fits perfectly. Well, R squared would be one minus zero over whatever SST is, and that would be one. So, or 100%, we could write it as. So we would say, my model explains 100% of the data. So that line, if, if I want to, you know, explain the variation and why, all I need is the, is the line, and I can explain everything. As opposed to a situation like this, where I'm trying to rig this, where there is no relationship, this would be the best, um, the best fitting line, where SS, um, uh, SSE would be the same as SST. You know, what would be the, the point of means? It would be this line right here. So they're the same. R squared would be one minus SSE all over SST, which is 0%. So I'm not explaining anything. All right, so that's the, um, that's a, that's a simple interpretation of R squared. Well, how do I get to a good estimator of my variance, of my, you know, the variance of these errors? So I'm not going to prove this. I'm just going to state a result, and the result is this. We could show that the expected value of taking SSE and dividing by n minus 2. So n minus 2 comes from the fact that I have two unknowns. I have an intercept and I have a sloped that I'm estimating. This is exactly equal to sigma squared. So SSE over n minus 2 gives me an unbiased estimator of, of, of sigma squared. All of this information is commonly summarized in something called an ANOVA table. So let me write out what the ANOVA tables often look like. R doesn't quite give you, give you an ANOVA table. Every other software, plan, every other software package on the planet kind of gives you this, this table, so you should have seen it. Um, and, and so the, uh, uh, the way a, a, an ANOVA table looks is this. You have the source. And so the source is either the model, the error, or the total. And you can think about having sums of squares here. So you have the, the SSR, SSE, and SST. So your, your um, model sums of squares plus your error equal the total. So with these ANOVA tables, we always add to get the bottom. Now, the next thing that you'll often see are the degrees of freedom. So we have one degree of freedom here. This has n minus 2 degrees of freedom. If we add 1 and n minus 2, we get n minus 1. Then what we get is um, another column called the mean squared. So the mean squared sometimes this is written MSR for the mean squared regression, is SSR divided by 1. The mean squared error, on the other hand, divide across is going to be SSE all over N minus 2. Finally, you know, most ANOVA tables don't do this, but if we were to divide across down here in the total, we get something that is very familiar, which is s squared sub y. So this is the sample variance of y. What is the sample variance of y? Well, it's SST all over n minus 1. So we have, um, you know, the variance of the errors. This would be the variance of the errors under this y bar model, but that's really just the, the sample variance. So that's some, something good to, to point out. All right. I now want to, um, I, I'm going to prove that the ANOVA identity works 
and give us a deeper understanding of, um, of R squared. So to do this, most textbooks will take you through the algebra of it. And the algebra is um, kind of tedious. And I, I, I'd like to show you a different way that I think is, is really beautiful. So remember I said a regression line passes through the point of means? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just make a transformation. So let's just say assume what we would, what we, what, what this would often be called is mean-centered data. All right. So what this means is I'm going to take x sub i, and um, I'm going to replace my x sub i with x sub i minus the mean. So I'm just going to, I'm going to center my x's. So now all of a sudden, uh, any value that's above zero would be above average. Any value that is negative would be below the average. And I'm going to do the exact same thing to my y. So y sub i is going to take the value y sub i minus y bar. And so, so basically what I've done in a picture like this is I've translated my origin from here up to the middle of this diagram. So now this, this diagram is centered at um, uh, the, the, the point of mean. So um, this would be the mean of x's. This would be the mean of y, which clearly it is. And what you should note is that once you've done this, this implies that your a is equal to zero. All right, so why is that? Well, go back to this equation that we had for this. If, um, if the mean of these centered x's, so the mean of this is now going to be zero, the mean of this is going to be zero, a is going to be zero minus whatever my slope is times zero. So my a will be zero. And we're just going to focus on the, on the slope. All right, so, so with this transformation in mind, I want to draw a picture that describes what we're doing. So the way to think about this is, a better way to think about this is, is, is to think out in n space. So let's say that this is the point of means, or 0, 0. I'm going to have some vector x. So we're going to think about x as an n-dimensional vector. So if, if, if this helps, you can think about this as, well, x1 through xn. So it's now we're way off in n space. And likewise, I've got a y vector sitting out here somewhere. So this is my y vector. Now, let's think about y hat. What is y hat? Well, after I've centered things, I don't need to worry about the intercept. So my y hat is just going to be b times x if we think about x as a vector. So this y hat is also a vector. Man, there's a lot of stuff on top of that, but yeah. So my y hat is going to be, um, it's going to be some multiple of these x's. All right, so what does a multiple of an x look like? So it's going to be some, something along this x direction. All right. Now, the OLS criterion said this. The OLS criterion said, pick beta to make the sum of, well, y sub i minus y hat sub i squared small. So minimize over your b, uh, that thing. And what I'd, what I'd like for you to note is what we're really doing is um, we're, we're going to minimize with respect to these b's. You can write this in, in a matrix form. Um, y as a vector minus y hat as a vector transposed times y as a vector minus y hat as a vector. And what, what, does, this, um, what does this thing look like? Well, I, I'm going to draw one, and it looks something like this. So this is your y hat vector. So that is a y hat vector. I'll put a little vector sign over it. And this is just um, b times x. Let me just isolate that over there. All right. So, so what's, what's really important to note 
is that my y hat vector is just some fraction of the x vector. And a way to think about this is I want to make my y as close as possible to the, um, to, to the y hat vector. So, so you can think of this vector right here as being my y minus my y hat as a vector. And so all OLS says uh, we want to make the distance between here and here as small as possible. So how do we do that? Well, the answer is you want to pick this y minus y hat vector. So th this is, you, you can also think of this as your residual vector. Um, so make it e hat squared, your predicted residual. Uh, you want to, you know, the way you could minimize the length of that vector would be to make this perpendicular. So if I, if I chose some other b, like this would be a, sh a shorter vector, but that makes these errors bigger. Likewise, if I chose an error out here, like if I chose my b vector to be out here, made your b bigger, then that, the length of that would be bigger as well. So that, that just doesn't work. What you have to do is have that uh, perpendicular. Well, if we, um, if we do that, it turns out that gives us a really simple way um, to find the OLS estimate. So recall that um, two vectors, so let's just say u and v, when these two vectors have a dot product of zero, um, u and v are perpendicular. Perpendicular, I think that's the way it's, all right. So if we wanted to derive our OLS estimates, here's a quick and very quick way to do this. All we'd have to do is say this. Um, I want my x vector to be perpendicular to the air vector, and, uh, and I'm done. So this means they have to be perpendicular, and I just want my x vector to be perpendicular to my air vector. So I'm, I'm going to stop putting the arrows on. So we can easily um, uh, solve this. This is going to be x transpose. And what is my air vector? It's just y minus y hat. And I'm going to go distribute this. So this is going to be x transpose y minus. Um, uh, let me rewrite y hat as um, uh, I sort of screwed this up. So, 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 so let, 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 me, let, me, um, let me try this again. Uh, this is going to be x transpose times y. What's, what's beta hat? Well, it's just y hat is b times x. All right, now we can, now we can do what I wanted to do. Um, this would be y transpose times y minus b times x transpose x. Um, we can go solve this for b, and we end up with, uh, I'm going to move this over to the other side, divide by x transpose x. Well, this is going to be x transpose y over uh, x transpose times x. So what is this? You can think of this as um, the sum of xi yi all over the sum of xi squared. And what did we find for our, um, our other um, OLS estimates? Well, we found the sum of xi times yi after we centered it, and remember we centered it here, divided by the sum of xi squared. And so we have the exact same estimates that we got, but I, I hope you agree that this is um, way easier than what we had yesterday. All right, well, I, I want to show you a few more things on, on, on this diagram. So what is SST after I've centered my, my um, my my vectors. So SST is just going to be the sum of yi squared. So what that really is saying is it's the um, the length of this vector is the square root of SST. Now what is this thing back here that I wrote? Well this is the sum of squared errors and so the length of this vector so I'm just going to say the length 
is equal to the um, square root of SSE. And what is this? Well, this is going to be the square root of SSR. So what, what was uh, SSR? It was really um, the sum of y hat minus y bar squared, but this thing is zero. So it's really just the squared length of, um, of my y hat vector. So, so you can think of this as y hat transpose times y hat. All right, now what's really important to notice is that this is a right triangle. And so we, we, we have a, you know, a, a, an expression that we learned all you know, back in junior high school that relates the lengths of the three sides of a triangle, and it's the Pythagorean theorem. So the Pythagorean theorem, remember, said you know, a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared if you have a right triangle that looks like this. So here's a, here's b, here's c. And so what we have in our case is, what is um, this leg squared? Well, it's SSR squared, but okay, it was square rooted, plus the length of this leg, well, that's SSE, and then the length of the hypotenuse is SST. So, um, we have just proven the ANOVA identity using the Pythagorean theorem, and that is way simpler than, um, than, uh, than doing the algebra, which is what you'd often see in a textbook. Okay, I want to make one, a couple more connections for us before I close this video. And so the question I have is, what is the angle between these two vectors. And so these two vectors could be y and x or y and y hat. Now, uh, I'm not going to prove this one, unlike the, the projection formula. I'm just going to remind you of a formula that you probably saw back in, in uh, maybe high school in analytic geometry, probably uh, in, in your calculus class. And that is, what's the angle between two vectors, uh, x and y? And you had a very um, a simple formula, which was this. Take x transpose times y divided by the length of x times the length of y. And so that's a, f a formula that, that, that gets covered in, uh, you know, again, maybe analytic geometry, probably calculus, almost certainly uh, if you took a linear algebra class, you'd get this. So you can think of this as x i y i divide by the square root of the sum, that's a sum sign, of x i squared times the square root of the sum of y i squared. So that's the length of x, that's the length of y, and that's the sum of the cross products. This, um, you know, is, is really just, um, it comes, one way to get it is from the, the law of cosines. All right, so what I want you to note is when my means are zero, this is really xi minus the mean, yi minus the mean, likewise down here, this is the correlation between x and y. So the correlation is just the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. Uh, so, so a couple of things on that. If this were x and this were y, and they were had a right angle, uh, the cosine of a right angle is zero. So the correlation between two orthogonal vectors, so think that this is a vector and this is a vector, if I had this as my x vector and this is my y vector, so y, um, sits, you know, in x, if you will, then the correlation between zero degrees is equal to one. So these would be perfectly correlated. If I had a situation like this, where this is my x vector, and maybe this is my y vector, 
So that's my y vector. This would be the cosine of 180 degrees, which would be minus 1. All right, so th that's, that's kind of cool. Well, what's another way to write the cosine? So the cosine of an angle is simply the side adjacent over the hypotenuse, if you remember the, the definition. And um, I'm going to square both sides. So let's just square this side. We're going to square this side. And so what I'd like to point out is the cosine squared is going to be um, the side adjacent is SSR. And the side hypotenuse is SST. Well, have we seen SSR over SST before? And the answer is yes, that's just R squared. So um, R squared is, um, you know, the, the, the squared length of the y hat vector uh, divided by the squared length of the hypotenuse vector. And so in this, in my, in my diagram here, my y hat um, was a positive fraction of of, of, of this x vector, and that's why um, you know, my sample correlation squared is exactly equal to r squared. The last thing that I want to do is to talk about the f test. So what is this f test test? And the answer is, let's go back to our uh, uh, statement earlier where we have um, the null hypothesis is that our slope is zero, and the alternative is that the slope is non-zero. So this is the, um, the, the, the test that we're going to do when we do an F test. Now in this unit on simple linear regression, this test is not that, um, the, the F test I should say, is not that important because we've already done it upstairs as a T test. In fact, you'll note the p-value um, for whether, in this, in this example, adds equals zero, is identical to the p-value for the f-test. But when you get to your multiple linear re regression uh, class, this f-test is going to be very important because you're going to be doing all sorts of things that you can't do with these t-tests uh, on the f-distribution. So what is an f-distribution? An f-distribution involves two independent chi-square random variables with certain degrees of freedom. And then what we do is we take the chi-square random variable, divide by its degrees of freedom, and then divide all of that by uh, the other chi-square random variable over its degrees of freedom. So I've um, written a clean copy of our ANOVA table. And so what we have is one chi-square random variable which is SSR, so this is a squared normal thing. I have another uh, chi-square random variable here, which is a sum of squared you know, normal things. And um, so, so these both have chi-square distributions. Here are their degrees of freedom. And when I get to this mean squared column, what did I do? Well, I divided the chi-square thing by its degrees of freedom. I divided the chi-square thing by its degrees of freedom. And so I, what I have here is exactly what I need to have one of these F-tests. Now, th there's one detail that maybe you're worried about, which is they're supposed to be independent. How do I know that the model and the air is independent of one another? Well, um, the simplest way to see this is... I'm going to just kind of mention that the, the, that when random when, when because these are orthogonal, they are independent of one another, and so that's a very simple justification for why I um, or how you know how I can assume independence in that case it's because of the orthogonality. So so that follows very easily from this geometric diagram. It's um, substantially harder if you're not using the um, the geometric figure. All right, so what we usually finish off our uh, ANOVA table with is a column giving the F statistic. So what is F? F is just the mean square regression 
divide by the mean squared error. And um, what happens is when, when your model fits very well, this is big, mean squared error hopefully is pretty small, and f is very big. So you take a big thing, divide by a small thing, you get a big thing. If your model is very poor, then mean squared error is going to be not very good. So, so the variance of your model, remember that's your y hat vector. Um, uh, well, I'm not going to try to sketch it here. But that would be very small, and this would be big, and f would be small. So um, this is going to be the distribution of f. We, we observe some f statistic. We find the area in the tail if we want to evaluate the p-value. So what's happening in the R output is we have an F statistic. So the F statistic here would be 130.6. Um, my degrees of freedom are 1 and 38. So that's given in the R, R output over here. Why 38? Well, we had 40 observations. So 40 minus 2 is 38. And we just found the p-value. The p-value is the area in that tail. So 7 times 10 to the minus 14th. That's extremely small. So I would um, reject H0. Which H0? Well, H0 that my slope is equal to 0. And I would conclude that, that my uh, slope is non-zero. So uh, that, that's a fairly quick treatment of the F distribution. You're going to get way more of this in the... Um, a multiple regression chapter, but I wanted to, um, you know, tell you what that line meant, and it, it, it ties very nicely with the other topics in this video. So let me just recap what we've done. So I've shown that. Well, I, I didn't show this, but I but I stated that the mean squared error from this table is an unbiased estimator of the error variance sigma squared. We've, um, we've gone over the ANOVA decomposition. We've seen the interpretation of R squared, the coefficient of multiple determination, and its relationship with the correlation coefficient and how when we square a correlation coefficient, we get that R squared. And then finally, I gave you just a kind of a sneak preview of the F test, linking back to what we did in the previous chapter where I introduced that F distribution.